Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Private Property Farming Podcast. My name is Mbali Moko, and um, today I'm joined by a young farmer, Byron Boyson, who is from the Western Cape, or farming in the Western Cape, rather, and um, his farm is called Boyson Tunnel Farming. So today the uh, topic that we're going to be discussing is greenhouse or tunnel farming, because that is what Byron is producing under in greenhouses, which is covered um, or covered or under protection type of farming. So um, without further ado, I want to introduce you to Byron, but um, I think I might just add that in today's topic as well, I think we might touch on something quite um, sensitive for some viewers, um, just based on Byron's story and sharing his experience. So I just want to express that um, the views expressed in today's podcast are purely those of um, the guests and um, not representing private property whatsoever. So um, yeah, please feel free to engage and interact with us as we are live on all the platforms, social media platforms to be specific. And, um, but let's get into it. Byron, how are you doing? Hello, good afternoon, Bale. How are you? I'm well, thank you. Uh, it's nice and warm here in Cape Town. How are you? I'm doing good, thank you. Has it been raining um, these past couple of days in Cape Town? It has been a much much cooler week this week, uh, so the tomatoes is taking some time to turn red, but uh, it's been a cool weather, uh, some rain, but mostly warm. Ah, oh, awesome to hear that. So I heard some tomatoes. Tell us about um, who Byron is and your production, and how did you get into farming? Yes, definitely. No, thank you for this platform. Uh, it's good to uh, have a talk here on private property. Um, I'm Byron Boysen. I'm from Kruifontein Avondrest Farm. Uh, that's where our, we lease uh, 1.7 hectares of land, which we have our greenhouse tunnels on. Um, in the greenhouse tunnels, we cultivate uh, vegetables hydroponically, um, and we do tomatoes, green peppers, green beans, etc. But my name in the community is sometimes saved as Byron Tomato, uh, because that's the, the quickest way my, my clients get to me. Um, so we have been farming now for six years um, and being here for six years uh, has learned us a lot of ups and downs, a lot of tricks to the trade and also how to, how to obviously do best practices in terms of what we do in our farming um, and also learn a lot from other people. Um, we have obviously been a, a company that has been supported by government. Um, I started this initiative when I was 23 years old with the idea of wanting to engage with people. And I, I saw an opportunity where obviously food security and, and uh, you know, food production is something key uh, to work creation and, and just being engaging with people socially. Um, for, for me, that was always the push to what do I want to create as an entrepreneur? And I wanted to be part of farming. Uh, I got the opportunity and I uh, applied my mind to an idea, business plan that was seen as, as credible and uh, I, I got support from the government, Western Cape Department of, Ag of Agriculture. Uh, through that support, we um, established infrastructure of which we now produce uh, anything from 40 to 120 tons of tomatoes per season, depending um, you know, uh, which crop and which cultivar we use. Okay, awesome. Um, it's very rare that people sometimes mention support from government. But if you could just elaborate, what type of support did you get? Was it financial? Was it technical? Um, we got a bit of both because of the program in cast funding. Um, there's uh, different funding available in government. And I think um, people should obviously engage government to see wh what is available and how is, what is the path you need to go at. Because having land available is a, is a crucial element. And mostly when, you, when we get questions, and I'm sure you get questions a lot as well, where people engage, how can I get involved with hydroponics or farming or, you know, outside farming? And then I, and I, and I, and I stood the need that um, you need land, you need water, you need to have a business plan, and you need a market. You need to engage and see. The mm. market, unfortunately, won't give you any contracts before that because you don't have a product yet. So you need yes. to go, 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 go do these things and even start, start it in a small scale just to give people a taste of what you can do. 
absolutely. I like that you said that, um, you know, your clients already call you by Byron Tomato. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> that's a brand already, you know. Um, Byron, tell me, the land that you're producing on, are you owning it or is it um, on a long-term lease? And um, secondly, why did you specifically decide to go for hydroponic farming and not farm directly um, in the soil? Thank you very much. I think that question is actually very integrated to each other because um, I don't own the land. I'm an Arvindrus farm is where Poison Tunnel Farming is situated. We rent uh, 1.7 hectares of land, of which the land is obviously um, very small in terms of outside farming. To be a subs uh, uh, subsist, you know, uh, commercial farmer and to produce and do a level to your market that um, is very sustainable, we chose hydroponics as the, the way forward because we can also uh, grow vegetables vertically. The vertical space that you have in the tunnel is also something that is, uh, needs to be counted for because crops mm -hmm. like tomatoes, intermittent tomatoes, green beans, and, and um, uh, green peppers and cucumbers are very good um, buying uh, you know, ripe products, which can obviously create a good yield, which is necessary for a small space of land. Absolutely. So you have to maximize um, every corner or every space or every square, uh, square meter on your farm to obviously get a good yield and a good return on investment on that yield. Is that Most correct? Definitely. Most definitely. Yes. Yes. So um, you mentioned that you're currently producing tomatoes, green beans, peppers, etc. How difficult was it to find market when you initially started off? And what type of clients are you also supplying to? Um, the, because we are so close to the, the, um, what is it, the residential border, there is a lot of need for people that uh, are creating their own businesses. So uh, walkers, uh, the informal, set, informal markets, um, the informal um, businesses that's around is a big, big, big yield. And a lot of people are very hungry for the, the amount of produce that we have especially to my valued crops like green peppers and tomatoes. Um, we did uh, sell to pick and pay at the beginning uh, small um, amounts, but because our enterprise is, is of such a uh, uh, um, you know, um, size that it's too small to produce to the retail, but too big to just be, be a local. Um, so mm. we are starting to breach that gap now by, by building more tunnels as we speak now, um, wow. to, bridge, to bridge that gap, to actually be, be able to go out to more commercial markets and establish the Byron Tomato brand or Boysen's Tunnel Farming uh, much more elegantly into the market. Wow. And Byron, tell us, how many people are employing currently? And, um, you know, just maybe explain in terms of your journey of being a business person as a farmer, having to manage employees as at such a young age, because you mentioned that you started at the age of what, 23, as I presume. Yeah, I know it, it's every year has been a learning learning stage. Uh, mm -hmm. It's not perfected at all yet. Um, so we employ about five people now, um, which is regularly on the farm. Uh, as yeah. we know, a lot of the things are seasonal as well, which because we don't necessarily harvest all the time. So we can't have everyone on station all the time. But mm. also the size of the, the business that it's effective to also manage your, your personnel properly because it also means that the ones that do work for you actually do have full-time work to sustain them um, and actually uh, where their income actually makes an impact in their livelihood much, much more sustainably than if it would be with a seasonal uh, worker um, outlook. Um, so it, it makes an effect on, on their livelihoods economically. Um, and that is the way we, our philosophy is in terms of how we employ and who we employ. And as you said, I was young at that stage and uh, I think I'm still, still young. I do still qualify as, as youth in the farming industry. Um, yes. <laughs> so there's still a lot of, lot of, lot of room to, to, to educate and, and learn from. Wow. So what are some of the mistakes that you've done in the past um, that you've definitely learned from today? And maybe, you know, for anybody that's listening, they could um, find value in, in some of those mistakes. Um, I think it becomes down to when you are too advanced, uh, um, explorative um, and, you know, excitable that you sometimes try new things that 
you know, nobody really tries in the area or whatever. Like I try to do baby marrows in the winter here in, in the in the in the Western Cape. Um, but I but I to do credit to to my mistake, I did do some research about you know the minimum temperatures in the area and it differs from other area, even a few kilometers from here. But you do make mistakes in terms of um, you know investing into that, and and then obviously not getting the returns that you're supposed to have made, but. We've learned that baby marrows can work in the tunnel in the winter, but you need bees to, to really pollinate okay. and help with that um, effectively, especially in, inside of a tunnel structure because you have insect insect netting which actually prohibits uh, that. So now I actually mm -hmm. have to have bees inside, but you know, I'm not a very talented beekeeper, so I don't know how that is necessarily going to, to work. So I need to upscale my skills in that regard. Wow, I mean, if I could share my experience fine i don't think they are good for tunnels um yeah because of the you know they need pollination and also they just need direct sunlight and I've, we've we've personally tried um back in i think 2017 um baby marrows in the tunnels and we just didn't get a a, a good outcome you know i, I definitely say that yeah. they perform better out stores um yeah without any protection and then i've also planted them under shade net as well um yes. they work slightly better but i just feel like you know they should just be left outside and um have uh, yeah i think just um take advantage of the full sun and the and the bees etc um and also when it rains it's you know you see very very nice fruits after that um but byron um Another question I wanted to is that um, you mentioned that when you started, you know, you had to do some research and you got some government support, etc. Till yeah. date, have you? Do you have mentors in your business? Um, and if so, what type of relationship do you have with them? No, very much so. Um, uh, also, my landlord is one of them. Um, I, I, I sometimes say I'm, I'm blessed with a lot of people with grey hair around me um, because um, all of that wisdom. <laughs> You really do learn from it, and, and luckily for me, it's it's all people that are very stable and a very positive outlook, which is in parallel to my own um, in terms of what we want to create, and that is opportunities. And also, if they see the willingness for myself to learn and also contribute to the agricultural sector, if, even if it is primarily to produce food for your, for your area, and I think um, um, we, we are very blessed in terms of having. Uh, good mentors around and and uh, my landlords I said one of them and there are many others I mean my my parents are also included into that and um, it's far beyond just technical mentoring it's also it comes down to financial technical um, you know plant based and also to, to look five to ten years ahead sometimes type of mm. mentoring because um, if I chose this as a livelihood then there are people that already have gone through these type of uh, situations. Um, even though we are, um, you know, in the in the light of where we are now in the world, we have different, you know, situations or problems to to deal with. Like, you know, obviously our current COVID nineteen being being a, a a current hurdle that we all have to get over with. But also see what opportunities there is to obviously help you sustain or be a, a futuristic farmer. Yeah? Absolutely. I think mentors are key in any operation or business operation rather. But are you currently mentoring any um, upcoming farmers or you in the area? Um, we, I am next year going to uptake a situation where uh, we are building tunnels at schools. Um, I am thinking about mentoring at that school where we are going to build these tunnels. Um, there is not a specific point out person that I am necessarily mentoring or business that I'm mentoring, but um, we have a large amount of interest. We are trying to slowly shift to become a, some sort of consultancy agency as well, because there's so, yeah. so, so much, uh, you know, um, uh, interest in it. And it's really, really a big uh, thing that I see everywhere where people are asking for assistance and we are wanting to, to invite interns and people that have studied uh, agri soil or any agricultural course to be able to come to Boise's Tunnel Farming, learn what we are doing, because at the end of the day, information can be there. You can have a gym program, but if you don't follow it, you're not going to get results. So um, it's also up to you to make it successful.
fact, you know, you were, your farm was, has been recently affected by land grabs. Tell us about mm -hmm. that situation and how it's disrupted your business and how you're dealing with um, this issue. Yes, um, for us, I think uh, the main issue practically for the business was the fact that our access road was blocked a lot and it became a bit risky to obviously leave and so on. Uh, I think we are in solidarity with the people that uh, the fact that people need housing, need access to land, need services, is it is an issue. Um, so, but being at the bordering of the farm and for my landlord, it, it was a big uh, complication because um, obviously it's private property, et cetera, and, and we're not getting any assistance or help from, from government per se to say that this is the negotiation, this is what's happening, nothing. So we have no direction in terms of that. And I think uh, for us and, and um, for us as a fa farming um, community here, uh, we would like th that that border um, you know, be protected in a way by giving people access to farming land, just to do subsistence farming, to also value the environment. Um, because there's a lot of uh, dumping happening. There's a lot of, um, you know, uh, non-environmentally friendly things happening, which I think we should go back to, even if we do build informally anywhere, we should have respect for each other and respect for the environment because we need to know and educate ourselves to, to know that we need that land again tomorrow. Um, you know, because at, at the end of the day, a lot of, a, lot, a lot of the stuff that's happening as well, and this is all my opinion, and some might share it and some might not share it, but um, when we take land informally and demand by means of protest for services, uh, we, either water or electricity or um, any other things that we might not have had, we are actually making each other poorer uh, because uh, people do not live in that situation now. All the guys that coordinated these stuff are, are gone or missing. Um, there's no electricity. Ooh. There's no uh, water for people. So, so the, the disruption of, of our, our, our community's moral fiber it is unfortunately has friction now because some has water and some doesn't have water. So, uh, and that obviously yeah. becomes a government problem, which we understand, but we need to somehow, the ones that have and don't have should agree that this is the way forward. Um, and to be honest, and we know emails do not work anymore. Emails <laughs> do not give us any attention, um, mm -hmm. but we, um, from our side, from a farming community side, we want to engage with the community and say, this is the land we have available. Let's do it differently because that's where the education part, part comes in. Uh, and then it, it engages youth, youth employment, uh, you know, kids that's playing around that doesn't have, uh, that's not going to school at the moment because of COVID. Um, they have, there's going to be social constraints and issues later on. What are we going to do? People are starting gangs and, and, and you know, uh, and, and we shouldn't forget these things if you do, are not in the area. It's going to affect everyone at the end of the day it, 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 and, and, and that is uh, where we should see that any bordering space that is wanting to be built at we need to with all the clever people we have architects and engineers and everything there should be a solution um, where we can give people basic um, and all the things they need to be mm. able to survive in a, a yeah, environmentally clean workplace you know yeah, Byron, excuse my ignorance here, right? Let's just take it back um, just a step. Let's just take it a step back. Um, okay. You're breaking up a what bit. What I want to understand but, is that... Pardon? pardon? You're breaking up a little bit now. Sorry. Yes, ma'am, I'm listening. Okay, so you mentioned that you're known in the area as Byron Tomato, right? So my understanding is that the community kind of knows who you are, what you're doing. You, they know that you're farming on this uh, fully functional enterprise. So now when 
one morning, or I don't know if you live on the ground, houses uh, producing, you know, going about your daily life and your daily activities at the farm. And then all of a sudden you just started to see people building. Like, how did this happen? Um, or did it just, or was it just one occupant putting a house then, you know, slowly but surely there was another and there was another, and maybe did you report that to police? But like, how did, how did these things happen? And the reason why I'm asking is that because we read about this in the news, we uh, read about it online in the news, um, but from um, an on the ground perspective, a reality uh, uh, perspective, mm -hmm. like how did this happen? How how did, how do these things just happen? You know, is it just overnight building, or does no. it happen gradually? Um, it's not overnight. It happens gradually, and it happened over time. There, there is frequent and a lot of documentation of us reporting this this issue, the need for people to have houses because we could see it happening slowly and slowly until one day came close to the election, uh, the previous election, I think, and it just boomed. Uh, there was many, many, uh, it was a collaborative thing. You could see it's not just one spot, it was all over, it's like spots all over, if it's the Western Cape or the country, it happened. Um, so uh, these type of movements are not necessarily coordinated with the, view that is just to give people access to, to homes, but it's actually people that, I should probably not even say this, that are profiteering from these type of things to, to liaise and, and group people together in that way. And I think at the end of the day, uh, a lot of this land was earmarked um, for development um, of, of homes with infrastructure and everything, but then the system takes too long to be able to engage with pe the people and, to, and negotiate terms which obviously one of the terms would be employ the people from our community, please, which is fair, um, but those things never filter through and it takes very long and people get uh, uh, within themselves get uh, frustrated and this movement is collaborated um, to distort everything. So a lot of people that is maybe standing in the line for many years are now going to be delayed even further. And that money that was earmarked for spaces to be developed is pushed back into budgets and who knows what happens with that budgets in the future um so mm. it, it, it is not, it's, it's not an overnight uh, problem it is something that's cooking and the government has been sitting on a on an egg and and, and not, not wondering what egg it is they're sitting on if it's a chicken egg or alligator egg or whatever they don't know i don't know if alligator is an egg but uh, you know um so something is cooking um, but at the end of the day, we can't dwell on those things. We need to see what, how can we, um, solve this, this, this issue. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Wow. It's going to take a very long time for you to, um, you know, find a solution that would work best for your farm for the yeah. for the for the people in the community and the owner of your property um so yeah i'm wishing you best of luck in just managing this out and i just really hope that your business whilst you're still dealing with this and i'm sure other farmers also have been affected is that correct or is it just you in that specific area um i, I think um, a lot of people do um, feel the effect of what is happening it's not just our farm or the farm here that is uh, on the border. I think it's something that far other farmers are prospectively seeing is going to be an issue because we have now become used to the fact that we can't do anything. There's no, there's no, um, there's almost no consequence for, for groups of yeah. people doing something that is not, uh, you know, de democratically chosen to do. It was, yeah. it was just within the, within their power to do it. And there's no there's no consequence, um, and it's because of I think apathy uh, from our, our our governments, and it's um, with with all due respect with the fact that even though their policies or whatever could be in, enabling us, uh, a lot of this stuff is taking away our power to be an individual that actually wants better for all of our people, um, because we do not deserve to just build build build. We deserve to to have an area to build properly with on infrastructure that we, we actually can uh, deem ourselves respected by our, our fellow citizens in the country. Yeah, well, but on a positive note, uh, Byron, and to close off our conversation, what is next?
for poison tunnel farming. Oh, thank you. That's very exciting. I think next for us is to obviously take over the whole northern suburbs and then uh, slowly uh, get, get our grip into the, the whole of the Cape Town area to really know that we are a prominent feature and a product to be dealt with. Um, we are moving into that, that space now. And uh, I think further for us to become a consultancy, building tunnels at schools, it's a big, big, big thing for us. And we want government and all want uh, NGOs and MPOs to support us with that. Because if you have uh, finance for those things, we have the expertise and we can implement it. And that's a very exciting thing all over South Africa. And we have uh, good partners that can help us to enable that initiative. All right, awesome. Wishing you all the best of success. And um, yeah, I know I know you're one farmer and entrepreneur that uh, we need to keep an eye on. So good luck with everything and happy harvesting, Byron. <laughs> Thank you very much. Same to you, Mbali. And then tri tribute to you. I would just like to say, I also brought my hat. Um, and I, and I, and I, and I uh, take uh, a lot of encouragement from what you are doing up north. Thank you very much. Thank you, Byron. Thank you very much. I'm sure we'll be in touch soon. Thank you for your time today. Thank you. Well, um, that was Byron Boyson joining us all the way from the Western Cape. Um, he is from Boyson Tunnel Farming. He's a young farmer that is currently producing high value crops in greenhouse tunnels and that are um, cucumbers, tomatoes, as well as peppers, supplying to his local market. And um, as you heard from his story, you know, um, he did all that he could um, just to make his farming reality, a uh, farming dream a reality. And that um, he's one that also commends the government for supporting him um, to kickstarting his project and his um, tunnel enterprise. So yeah, um, I hope you got enough, uh, a lot of inspiration and value out of our conversation today. And uh, please do join us next week as we're joined by another guest and keep those questions, comments, likes, shares, coming. Um, the video would be uh, posted live onto um, all the private property platforms post this, but most importantly, you could catch it on YouTube channel. And yeah, see you next week. And thank you very much for your time. Take care.